he is from Walt Disney Imagineering down in Southern California and has a, a, a long career in a lot of different industry. But, uh, you know, the beautiful part about this is that Hardy's a maker, just like everyone else here. So thank you, Mavani. Hi. I think I might be a bit of a ringer in this group because I'm not an artist. I am an electrical engineer. But the thing I've done here combines art and interactivity. And before I give the talk, which I'm going to have to find here, see if I can do this upside down. Okay, before I give the talk, I'm gonna ask a couple of young makers to come up, and I'd like to demonstrate the interactive zoetrope so you'll know what I'm talking about. And you're gonna come up right there, and we're gonna get maybe one other person. Do you have a hand raising? Okay, the gentleman with the red shirt there. Orange. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, orange. <laughs> okay, and what I've got here is a platter some ping pong balls on it. Okay, the platter is like sort of a plate. You're gonna stand right there. And you're gonna come on, here's your device. Here's another one. And we may be able to see this with the lights fully up or not. I'm gonna spin it. I'm gonna ask you to talk into that microphone. I'm gonna ask you to talk into your microphone, ready? What are This is, the world's first, this is the world's first interactive zoetrope. And by the time I finish my little talk, you'll know what a zoetrope is. It's been around for a long time. And um, this is the world's first one that actually has the ability to respond to the people that stand in front of it. So what's a, uh, what's a zoetrope? OK, our volunteers are almost done there. You want to talk a little bit more? <laughs> I think the best thing about an interactive zoetrope is that it's fun. <laughs> so I was lucky enough well, to that's be. That's not fun. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. I was lucky enough to be out on the floor with this a little bit uh, this morning and watching kids play with it, and um, that's fun. Okay, my volunteers. I'm getting dizzy now. I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> okay. You guys can sit down. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> okay. All right. What is a zoetrope? A zoetrope has been around since the 1800s, and they were actually parlor toys. You can make one as young makers by taking a cardboard cylinder, drawing faces, or drawing uh, different character positions, just like you would in a cartoon that move a little bit from position to position. Slits cut around the edge of the spinning cardboard will allow you to see just fleeting glimpses of these individual frames of animation. And that's the way cartoons are generated. How many people here watch cartoons? I do, I like cartoons, right? And cartoons, at least in the old days, used to be hand-drawn pictures that are just a little different from picture to picture. And if they're shown one right after the other very quickly, and we have fleeting glimpses of them, they appear to move. And that's how movie, movies work. That's how all of the things that had motion in them work. Um, there is a wonderful zoetrope. If any of you uh, have a chance to visit Disney's California Adventure, there's a very large zoetrope it's made by the Pixar Corporation, it, which is uh, actually part of the Walt Disney Corporation, which I am from. And um, it brings to life all of the uh, characters from Toy Story. It's about eight feet in diameter. It's a gigantic platter. And it has statues made with a process called stereolithography. That's where a computer actually makes a physical object, building it a layer at a time. And essentially, it's a solid cartoon. It's a cartoon where statues of the characters come to life. It's a wonderful show. It was my inspiration for the interactive zoetrope. And the only misgiving I had about it is that it doesn't change from minute to minute. The same show 
goes on over and over. And I wanted a zoetrope that allowed people who are watching it, our guests in the theme parks, to change what happens in it. So if we remember um, some of those old movies, King Kong and that sort of thing, they were done with stop motion animation. Basically, a maquette, that's a little statue, is moved a little bit at a time. Pictures are taken of it, taken of it and those pictures are played rapidly in sequence, and it makes that little maquette monster come alive. And I wondered whether we could use the same technique to make things come alive if I could choose which of several character positions I wanted to display each time my zoetrope platter goes around. I could instantaneously compose a complete show that would never repeat and was dependent on how people spoke into, let's say, a microphone. Now, the original prototype, which is this. I, I have to say that Disney and Pixar have taken this concept much further. This is literally the first prototype. And I needed something to test it with. So I said, well, I can glue some plastic ping pong balls. That's how I got here, because we did use plastic. I mean, there they are, plastic ping pong balls. <laughs> and um, I thought that I, I was going to have to do a great deal of work to register the ping pong ball faces carefully and make sure that they were stenciled exactly into place so that when they were strobed, when, the, when we got those fleeting glances of them, they would line up perfectly. I knew a wonderful artist at Disney uh, named Amy Van Gilder. And I set up the ping pong balls on this very platter, hot glued them on using those wonderful techniques from Home Depot, and um, got everything aligned. And I said, gee, Amy, can you draw wonderfully, completely aligned pictures? She gets a magic marker out starts drawing like this. You can't see it here, but quickly, rapidly drawing faces. She's a wonderful person, but I said, oh, gee, I, my, my, my ping pong ball zoetrope is not going to work. It's not going to be lined up. She's not a technologist, so at the end, she's a great artist. She says, well, honey, how do you make it go? I turned it on, and I got the best result I'd ever seen, <laughs> I think, that we've ever done. <laughs> so it has stayed this way, still stuck in a vise, still on this optical bench platform. <laughs> But um, it turns out I think it's, it's a peak. Now, for those of you who are into the electronics, I'm gonna, because I've gotten a lot of questions, how does it work, how does it work? I'm gonna quickly go through this. Way at the top, there's a motor turning the platter, right, with the ping pong balls on it. At the bottom of the motor, a lot of people say, well, how do you know where the ping pong balls are on the platter? There's a thing called a shaft encoder. It tells, it sends out an electrical signal that tells the number of degrees of the platter rotation. There are comparators from one to eight that allow my circuitry to know where on the platter the ping pong balls are. And if you've ever um, had some high fidelity equipment that has uh, one of those gauges on it, LED gauges, bar graph that um, moves as the music is playing, essentially each of those bar graphs is comprised of LEDs that turn on at different audio levels. I use that same integrated circuit those are those uh, pulse generator switches, or actually it's the audio uh, level meter at the bottom, that choose every single rotation the best ping pong ball to light. And each of the ping pong balls has an increasingly big face from you know, hardly smiling or hardly having its mouth open to wide open mouth. So if you're talking loudly during a revolution, my circuitry will choose and flash that is strobe, the ping pong ball face that corresponds to the loudest position, millisecond by millisecond. If you are talking with a low voice, very, not very loudly, then I choose the ping pong ball that's most closed. Together, as the machine runs quickly, those superimposed faces um, form a moving image of a person talking. So here's, uh, this is Katie Bassett in my lab, uh, my lab associate that's talking and demonstrating that as you talk, the louder you talk, the louder the position of the mouth, and you can animate, in this case, ping pong balls. But the real power of this technique comes when you animate something a little more interesting than ping pong balls, which we've done. We've animated holograms. So we just did a, a presentation at a technical conference called SIGREP, and there, we had a floating sort of monstrous face <laughs> that animates floating in free space as a person talks. We've also done maquettes 
small characters that come to life as they rotate. And the technique can bring even statues of great precision to life and give them motion. So, um, in general, what we've got here is a way to animate characters in real time. We can animate holograms. We can have all sorts of human input. Here, I've used microphones and the sound of a human voice to animate a character because it's appropriate here. Computers could animate characters that are, for instance, playing a game of tennis to make a, a solid state game that, instead of being sort of on a screen, plays out in real life in front of you with little characters who are actually playing the game. It's like you have control of it. Um, you can do things. We <laughs> had a wonderful talk about eye tracking here, and we've done a few things with eye tracking so that the characters look around, et cetera. So I'd invite any of you who are interested after the talk to come up and give it a whirl. So thank you very much.